I'm going to be speaking from uh, the word from um, Zephaniah, another minor prophet. And I'm going to just start with uh, Zephaniah. I'm just going to pick this uh, scripture out of the middle of it here. Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse number 1 contains most of my thought of what I want to talk about today. Zephaniah chapter number 2 and verse number 1. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. This is speaking of a nation not desired. It, it actually means a shameless nation. Like there's no shame. They just go about doing their wickedness and there's no shame. And you know, I thought about that's how that's how the United States is today, or the world is today. Amen. Uh, I don't think anybody gets embarrassed anymore. You know, there's no shame. You see the way that people uh, act, and the way that people talk, and the way that people dress, and the way that people look. There's just no shame in the world today, is there? No shame. But he's speaking to this nation, oh, uh, shameless nation. He said in verse 2, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the shaft, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, before the day of the Lord. And we've talked about the day of the Lord <clears throat> back as a theme in Joel chapter, or in the book of Joel, uh, but also here in uh, Zephaniah, he talks a lot about the day of the Lord, and we'll be talking about that here in just a minute. But it says, um, the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Verse number three, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So right here in the middle of Zephaniah, there's only three chapters in Zephaniah, but in the second chapter here, he gives the solution to the problem. He gives the solution to what we need to do. And there it is in verse 3. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness, and it may be... Um, and it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. And my thought today, and it's going to take me a while to get there, but is hidden by God. The church, the believer is hidden by God, amen, or God's keeping power, amen. How many know that God will keep you? It doesn't matter what comes in this world. It doesn't matter how bleak it looks, how bad it looks around us, amen, Stay in the church, stay in the Lord, amen. He's going to hide you in his pavilion. So <clears throat> in verse 2, the day of the Lord, it's uh, found seven times, at least seven times. It's used in different ways, but at least seven times you could just pick right out where it says the day of the Lord in this book. And we found it five times in the book of Joel. But remember, when we're talking about the day of the Lord, it's talking about there's an intimate uh, destruction or judgment that's coming right then for the children of Israel. They've done something. The day of the Lord's going to come, he's, and it, had, it did come. It come to the uh, destruction of Israel, the northern kingdom, and also to Judah and Jerusalem of the southern kingdom. And so it was going to be <clears throat> a, de a devastation for the wicked. Also, it's going to be a day of deliverance. Sometimes it's used as a day of deliverance for the righteous. But in either case, and this is kind of what stood out to me, is that the Lord is going to manifest himself. Amen. His word is settled. His word is true. And no matter what, there's coming a day of of judgment upon this earth. There's coming a day of judgment for mankind, and it's going to happen. <laughs> and he's going to manifest himself, and he tries to make um, a way of escape. But he is going to make sure 
that he is, you know, he's, uh, he doesn't just come in and make himself known and just make everybody straighten up. He gives us that will that's within us. Amen. And even Jesus, when he was uh, being questioned there in the court right before his crucifixion, Jesus made this comment. He says, you know, I could call ten thousands of legions of angels or whatever it was. He said, I could have them come right now. But my kingdom's not of this world. Amen. He can, God's got all the power. It may not look like it when we look on the world at hand. And that's why we have to keep our vision in the word of God. Amen. Because the wor world's getting pretty bad. Amen. The world's getting out of hand. We've got to be careful we don't get used to it. Amen. To realize that the word of God stands. The word of God prevails. And God is going to make himself known in the future day. And then there's days that he has here where he makes himself manifest. One of those is in first, or John chapter 1. <clears throat> John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, in verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible, it says at the beginning, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he said, then the Word was made flesh. This Word was manifested in the flesh through Jesus Christ. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory spoken here means very apparent. In other words, it was very apparent that God had manifest himself to the world in the flesh. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And even though there's a judgment coming, he sees, he's constantly saying that everyone all these uh, minor prophets that I've been studying and I've been talking about when I have the opportunity to speak, even though the, the judgment is going forth and there's coming day when they're going to repay, have to pay for their uh, wickedness, at the end there's always a restitution that he puts forth because God's a God of love and a God's a God of mercy. Aren't you thankful for that? He loves us. We're his creation but he made himself very apparent in the form of Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God was made apparent to us in the flesh through Jesus Christ. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, received up, into glory. 1 Peter 1.18 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest, that glory, same as the glory, same word, manifest to render apparent. It was manifest in these last times for you. Amen? Aren't you thankful that God robed himself in flesh and dwelt among us and went and died for us at the cross? Amen? God's good, isn't he? His mercies are everlasting. Amen. And you know, we, I think we constantly battle with uh, not being good enough, right? And I'm probably getting ahead of myself a little bit, but we always think that, you know, we've sinned, we're just sinners, you know, and we've done all these sins against God. <clears throat> and so God uh, is merciful to us, or we try to to bring ourselves to a place where God can forgive us. Amen. But we have to remember that we were born into sin. We are sinners when we are born. Amen. And so God already <clears throat> had this plan 
<clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> God already made it, and because of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, God already planned this. Amen. That's why he said in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with flesh, with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. Amen. He came and died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, amen, should not perish but have everlasting life. So we don't, <clears throat> we are made righteous by the righteousness of God. And God loves us so much that he has made a provision for us. Amen. And in that process, he's constantly making himself manifest to us. Amen. God will manifest himself to you. And actually, that's the difference really between praise and worship. You know, people, we can praise him. We can lift up our hands and praise him because he is worthy, because of who he is. But I think when we worship him, we worship him because we know of what he's done in our life. Amen. And, you know, I've, I've really... I just never, and I thank the Lord for it, but I've never forgotten where God's brought me from. <laughs> I've never forgotten, I've never got over the fact that God lifted me out of the miry clay, and I never got over the fact that God saved me from alcoholism and how God just delivered me in a powerful way. And when I think about that, I can't help but to worship God and to glorify Him and and that's the difference between praise. Praise is what he's due. The whole world, the whole uh, creation praises God. He says, if you don't do it, the rocks are going to do it. Amen. Somebody's going to praise him. But when you realize what God has done for you, hallelujah, amen, it brings out an inner worship from our souls and from our hearts. Amen. And we don't just worship him with our lips, but we worship him with for our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. As he manifests himself to us, he actually shows us who we really are. He, manifest, we, he reveals to us who we are, and we begin to change and try to become more like him. Amen. He's such a good God, and he'll, he'll manifest himself to you time and time again. He'll, he'll do it. Get into the word. Get into the church, and, and God will move in a mighty ways. How many know that to be true? Amen. <clears throat> so in John chapter number 14, Jesus is talking with his disciples in this whole chapter, and he's telling them, I got to go away. I'm going to go away, but I go to prepare a place for you. And they're saying, you know, where are you going? And he says, you know the way. And they said, no, we don't know what, we don't know what you're talking about. And he said, well, I'm, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You know, I'm going to the Father. And one of them says, well, you know, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And he said, have I been so long with you that you have not known me yet, Philip, that you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm, manif I'm a manifestation of the Father. Hallelujah. And so in if, um, verse 22, Judas said unto him, not Iscariot, not Judas Iscariot, not the one that betrayed him, but another Judas said unto him, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and, to not, the, and not the world? Jesus answered, said unto, the, unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And he will come unto him and make his abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken to you, being yet present with you. Verse 26 is where I want to get, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. How are you going to manifest yourself to us? Through the Holy Ghost, through the comforter. I'm going to come unto you, Jesus said. Amen. So it's the Holy Spirit that now becomes that manifestation of God to us. Amen? And we can all receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? The Bible says, let us come boldly into the throne room of grace, that, that presence of God 
we can come in with confidence, with boldness. He says it's open to all now. It's not just something behind a veil, <clears throat> but the veil has been torn and I have manifest myself to you. He said, how are you going to manifest yourself? And he says, it's the Holy, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. He names it, who the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And so we see that the Holy Spirit <clears throat> is this manifestation for us today. And so the question is, you know, how do we know that we have the Holy Spirit? We, we know here, Pentecostal, that speaking in tongues is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's a manifestation that God is with us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Acts chapter 10, 44. <clears throat> Peter's preaching to some Gentiles. It says, as he spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, or the other Jews that were with, with him, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. All right? Verse 46, 4. Amen? 4. That word means assigning a reason for, used in an argument, indeed, or no doubt. The reason that they knew that they heard the Holy Ghost is for they, or they received the Holy Ghost was that they heard them speak with tongues, amen, and magnify God. Then Peter said unto them, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So this... <clears throat> For this powerful thing, he says, how did they know it? How did they realize they had the Holy Ghost? They heard them speak with tongues. It was a manifestation, a physical manifestation of God's Spirit. And that's how you know that you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you speak in an unknown tongue, a heavenly tongue, an unknown language to you. Amen? And in Acts chapter 19... Paul's preaching to some disciples, and he asked them this question. These were disciples of John the Baptist. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, then what were you, how were you baptized? They said unto John's baptism. Then <clears throat> Paul said unto them, then said Paul, John truly baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So here he's found some believers. These were people that believed in Jesus already. And the question, have you received the Holy Ghost since we believed. Well, if you just received the auto Holy Ghost automatically by believing, this question would never have come up. Correct? They already believed. And so he brings forth the question, <clears throat> have you received it since you believed? And they said, we haven't heard so much whether there be this Holy Ghost. And he prayed for them, laid his hands upon them. The Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So back to John 14, looking at verse 16, it says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. He's speaking of himself here. He said, the Spirit of truth, you know him. I'm with you now but I'm going to be with you. So the manifestation at that time and age was the actual physical body of Jesus Christ. And he said, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to come to you, manifest myself to you through the Spirit. And I know 99.9% .9 of us already know all these scriptures, very familiar with us. Amen. 
But the point is that the Holy Spirit and what I want to reiterate to us is the manifestation of God in our lives. God's presence. Let's not ever get just used to it or just let it be a common thing that we have God in us. Hallelujah. He's in us and he's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. He's going to keep us. Amen. For ye know him, he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I, Jesus speaking, will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Amen. So let's go back to Zephaniah, in the third chapter there of Zephaniah. <clears throat> I want to look at verse 8. Wherefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day. God has certain days. He has appointed times. Amen? And he has a certain day for you if you've not yet repented of your sins, been baptized in Jesus' name, and received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. He has a day appointed for you. He has a certain time. He has a day Amen, that he wants you to come to know to the knowledge of the truth. So anyway, <clears throat> Zephaniah 8, wait upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I will raise up prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. We talked last week, I think it was, about we serve a jealous God. <clears throat> and that just means he's madly in love with us. Hallelujah. And he's not going to let anything happen to us. Amen. <clears throat> but there's coming a day, and this uh, is probably speaking, most commentaries believe it's speaking about the millennial reign when God's going to bring everyone together and they're going to go through the tribulation. But at the end, the millennial reign is the day a thousand years of God's kingdom established here on earth. For then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. So this complete unified faith is going to be fulfilled one day with the millennial reign of Christ. But it's also brought to us and noted, amen, that these days of the Lord are brought before us and made manifest to us, amen. Partial fulfillment is the speaking in tongues that we read about in the book of Acts, this pure language. God is leading us and guiding us, hallelujah. And one of these days, he's going to set up his kingdom here on this earth. Can you say thank you, Jesus? Joel talked about it in Joel 2 and 11. The Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide, who can abide it? <clears throat> Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fastings and weepings and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn to the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of evil so it's in the heart we know that it becomes this heart issue it's not just something that we go through the motions and you're never ever going to be able to clean yourself up on the outside enough to be righteous but it's within us hallelujah Rend your heart, your innermost being. And we need to do this, church. We need to do it every day. Rend our heart. Give ourselves to the Lord and say, God, not my will, but thy will. Amen. Rend our hearts and not just our garments. Turn to the Lord. He's gracious and merciful. Amen. Look down at verse 26. <clears throat> and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. You know, you can just go on and on 
with this, uh, looking into this, but I think it's in Romans chapter 5 where he says, you know, we glory in tribulations because tribulations worth uh, patience, patience, experience, experience, hope. And hope never makes a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by what? The Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. So when you begin looking into this and how God manifests himself and the Holy Spirit, it's not just limited to a few verses in the book of Acts, but it's all through, amen, the word of God, that God wants to speak to us. God wants to be with us. He wants to live with us. Hallelujah. He wants to be our God. Hallelujah. Verse 27, and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, for I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Hallelujah. This is the verse of scripture that Peter used on the day of Pentecost when everybody was asking, what does this mean, this Holy Spirit, and these people speaking in other tongues? He used this portion of Scripture and quoted it. Amen. And he talked about the day of the Lord <clears throat> that is coming. Isaiah talked about it in Isaiah 28, verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherein the <clears throat> wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. He said, I'm going to speak to my people, and this is the rest. Hallelujah. This is our Sabbath. The Holy Spirit is our rest. It's our strength. It's our protection. It's our, it's our everything, church. If you feel overwhelmed by this world and the things that are coming upon this world, or even in your own personal life, you got to find yourself a place with God. Be refilled with his spirit because he's going to give you the peace that passes all understanding. Hallelujah. God is good. He wants to be with us. This is real. We're in a real spiritual warfare. We are in a real battle. And I see it more evident as the day approaches of his soon coming. We are in a warfare, hallelujah, and we are going to have to make, what as they say, war on the floor, hallelujah. We're going to have to get in touch with God. We're going to have to have the Holy Spirit fresh in our lives to be able to make this, amen, hallelujah. But he's in us. Think about that. God with us, that you're never without him. And so just remember that when we're talking about the day of the Lord, it was twofold. Sometimes it was immediate. Sometimes it's, it's in the future. And some, sometimes we realize that and we know that this outpouring of the Holy Spirit's already taken place. And it's a promise for you. Hallelujah. It's for you to whosoever will. Amen. So when we look back in our main scripture, and I said in uh, Zephaniah 2, it says it gives the solution to the problem. <clears throat> Seek the Lord. Verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3. All ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid. Hallelujah. God hides us. God's got this protecting power that he has. So if you look into the book of Zephaniah, one. It's talking about the destruction that's coming to Judah in, uh, in particular and Jerusalem. And in, uh, next it talks about God's complaints, what the, the people have done. And, and then third it talks about the destruction of all the nations, all, not just Jerusalem, but those that are around us. And then, of course, it tells us in the end of restitution. So it brings out these complaints, and there's many of them if you look into it, but just some that popped out to me, they were worshiping idols. They had, and an idol's just something that you put before God. Amen? We can't have anything before the Lord. Amen? <clears throat> they had left off praying. They did not seek the Lord in prayer. They didn't really believe in 
the day of the Lord. It reads this. They said in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. In other words, they were just like, God's not going to move. He's not going to do anything. But there's, they didn't really believe in a day of the Lord. But there is coming a day of the Lord. Amen. They were rebellious. They overindulged. And they were not careful with the word of God. Amen. <clears throat> I don't want to overindulge in the things of this world. I don't want to rebel in my heart against God. I want to get into the Word. I want to know what the Word says. I want, I want to be careful in handling the Word of God. Hallelujah. This right here. Brother Easter said, bring your Word with you to the house of the Lord. Amen. There's power in the Word. It'll move upon you. Amen. I know that to be true. I've testified this many times, but I wasn't even looking for the Lord, really. I was just reading the Word because I had 15 minutes to spare, and it was just there available, and God began to move in my heart because it's a living Word. It will speak to you. Hallelujah. It will lead you, and it will guide you. <clears throat> so seek righteousness. Romans 3, verse 21 but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. We are made, uh, it, the righteousness of God has come to us, not just through the law, not through just doing right or wrong, but now it's brought to us through Jesus Christ. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned, We've all sinned, <clears throat> come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of him who, which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what? Law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. <clears throat> so righteousness, and I've talked about this too, but we become righteous through Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's the only way that we can be righteous. It's not through the law the law, if it was able to, to make one righteous, then there would not have never been a need for Jesus Christ to come. So we cannot be made righteous just through the law and through doing this and doing that. But we become righteous through Jesus Christ. And when we receive him, when we receive that manifestation of him within us, that's when we're able to become righteous. Not that we live a perfect life, amen, but we have a mediator now between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. He's made that intercession for us for the propitiation of our sins. He's taken them away. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the righteousness. The other one he said was to seek meekness. Amen. To humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Amen. Amen. To humble ourselves, that's to beat down this old flesh and to realize that we are nothing within ourselves. We need God, amen? The world is saying there is no God, we don't need God, we'll do it our own way, hallelujah. But we see where that's leading to, that's leading to a bunch of destruction and chaos, amen. But we know that there's a God in heaven, the day of the Lord is coming when he's going to make himself known to all nations. Amen. <clears throat> Zephaniah 2.15 said, This is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am and there is none beside me. He's speaking of Nineveh here, I believe. He was saying, you know, I am, we are, look at us, we are great, and there's nobody else like us. Nobody can overcome us. This is how great we are. Said in her, I am, and there is none beside me. 
How is she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down in? But God says this in Isaiah 45, 18. Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he that established it, he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Amen. In our own life, in our own flesh, in our own heart, we try to lift ourselves up and say, I am. I can do this. I am. Right? And there's no, I don't need anything else. But Jesus is saying, I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in the dark place of the earth. I said not to the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Hallelujah. Let's skip down into verse 21. Tell ye and bring them uh, near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient times? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. And a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Verse 23, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Every knee is going to bow to the Lord. Every tongue is going to confess. There's coming a day. Believe that? There's coming a day when everybody's going to do that. <clears throat> and I would suggest you do that on this side of that day. Knee, bow your knee, humble yourself, and say, Lord, I know that you are the only God. You are God alone. Amen. And the other thing that is said in that Zephaniah 2, in verse number 3, it says that you may and ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Zephaniah's name actually meant <clears throat> God hides, amen, as in a treasure. God hides us. Psalms 27, verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Even the wicked, even my enemies and my foes came up to eat up my flesh. They stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Hallelujah. God's not giving you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. The psalmist said, one thing I have desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire, hallelujah, in his temple. You're in the right place today. You're in the house of the Lord, hallelujah. It's the beauty of the Lord that we begin to worship and we can inquire he has the answer to whatever you have in your life. You believe that? He's the answer to everything. It may look impossible. It may not come out the way you wanted it to come out, but God's got the answer. Hide yourself in him. Amen. He said, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me, hallelujah, in his pavilion. In the secret place, in a hiding place of his tabernacle, shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock, a firm foundation. Hallelujah. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing. Yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Woo. God is good. I said, God is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, and will with the temptation also make a way to escape. 
a hiding way, a place to escape. Anything that comes against you in this world, God is going to make a way of escape. Isaiah 43, verse 2, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Amen. We saw the sight and sound presentation of Daniel, I think it was, and King Nebuchadnezzar, who was at the king at the time, if I might get my kings wrong, but it was the king at that time over Babylon. When they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace, he saw that, right? And then when he brought them out, uh, they, and uh, he said, everybody is going to worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, everybody's going to serve. But just a few scenes later, he had already forgotten of what he saw. Amen? So we, just because we, God has a great manifestation in our lives, and just because he does great things to us, we have to constantly remind ourselves that God is on the throne. Amen? You can't go off an experience you had 20 years ago because soon you'll begin to doubt and the fear of things of this world. Keep it renewed. Keep it refreshed. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> Being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day, till the day of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. God's going to keep you. He's going to be with you. Amen. Until he comes back. He's begun a good work in you. You're here because God has moved on you in some way, shape, or form. You can say, no, somebody just invited me and I just showed up today. No, you're here by an invitation of Almighty God. Hallelujah. He's begun a good work in you. He can perform it. He'll work it. You don't need to fear. <clears throat> I close with this, Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee. Hallelujah. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Hallelujah. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. That just means he's not going to speak about it. He's not going to speak about your thoughts. He's resting in his love. He came and died for you. Amen. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. God sings over us. God rejoices over us. Do you believe that? Do you believe God? Oh, you think, no, I'm just, no, God can't. I'm not good. I'm not a good person. Amen. God looks down on you. He rejoices over you that the fact that you're here today, he's singing. Hallelujah. And in 15 minutes, we're going to come back here and we need to be singing. Hallelujah to the Lord, for God is good. Hallelujah. His mercies are everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. God bless you. Let's stand. <clears throat> that uh, Zephaniah 317 is actually a song, and if I was a singer, I'd sing it to thee. But the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Hallelujah. God bless you this morning. You're dismissed in the fear of the Lord.